Welcome to Fort Knox. Uh, once again, I am John Fort here this time with Abe Wemimo, co-founder of Isusu. And uh, welcome, first of all. Uh, second of all, I always start off asking about the toughest problem that you are solving uh, right now. And uh, it's kind of an interesting space that you're in. Uh, it has to do with credit. It has to do with the property market and renters being able to use on-time rent payments um, to help their credit score. So given what's happening in the economy right now, um, given all the sorts of pressures, what's the, what's the toughest problem that you're facing? Thanks a lot for having me. Um, deeply appreciated. You have a very you know, good question regarding the, the, the toughest issues that we're seeing in the marketplace right now. For me, it's really, you know, the rising cost. Inflation is incredibly high at this juncture. Um, inching, you know, to, you know, close to 9%, which is absolutely unsustainable in our recent lifetime. It's something we have not seen. And the implications, particularly to what we do here um, at Isusu, is there are 45 million people that can get access to financial products because they don't have a good credit score. And then you have a situation whereby, you know, 76% of Americans have less than $400 in their bank account. So as price continues to go up, you know, the situation at this point with inflation is not sustainable. It's like building a mansion on a sinking sand. So that keeps me up at night because of, you know, the hundreds of millions of people um, that are going to suffer um, as a result of this skyrocket in price. Yeah. And, and the numbers just overall in the economy don't show this well, I think, because if you're one of the, the relatively few right, who own stocks or who own property, then you've seen your property values go up. If you just kind of did what the the standard advice is and invested in the S&P 500 last year, you saw those investments rise by more than 25%. But if you're in the segment of the population that's not invested in the stock market, that doesn't own a home, and that's most people, right, then you saw your expenses rising faster than your income. And now, you know, with inflation, as you mentioned, that's going to be even worse. So um, to, to what degree can Isusu help, right? Because um, if you've got to have debt and interest rates are rising, then your debt's getting more expensive too. Absolutely, John. You, you really dissected the current state of what's going on um, spectacularly, in my opinion. You know, if we take a step back memory lane, right, we have a situation whereby this United States was built on cheap debt. Um, when, especially when we think about um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal um, and the Federal Housing Authority providing cheap loans to particularly, you know, folks that are non-Black to get access to home ownership. Um, and when you think about the racial wealth divide today, you have the average white family has 10 times as much wealth than the average Black family. And to your point, a lot of the you know, acceleration of wealth we saw last year and coming into this early innings of this year is really derived from things like home ownership. And if you have fiat cash, that continues to devalue, particularly with inflation. So what we're seeing here is the lack of access to quality financial products, which the biggest impediment is having a good credit score, um, is really pulling a lot of people behind. So that's something that's really top of mind and something that keeps me up. And I hope, you know, with what we're doing at ASUSU, which is capturing alternative data to help people establish and build their credit score, can help right that wrong and help people live their financial best. So um, explain to me how it works. Um, so it's at the building level, right? Uh, mostly multifamily, large building. Um, are they paying you? as clients to collect and process this data? And what's their incentive to do it? Is, is it that the residents are more likely to pay on time if they know that it's helping them build their credit? Precisely. So if we take a step back, what we do at ASUSU, John, is we work with large um, landlords and property managers to help residents capture rental information and report it into the credit rates and agencies. This would help them establish and build their credit scores. In addition to that, for folks that can't afford to pay rent, we offer them a zero interest microloan so they are not ev evicted. 
And as a society, we're not solving homelessness backwards. The value proposition to the landlords and asset and property managers we work with is simple. When you report this data, there's this mental model that drives on-time payment. Studies from TransUnion actually saw that when rental data is being reported, seven out of 10 residents pay their rent on time. Number two is when, especially during COVID, where we've seen a lot of rental shortfalls, we had the eviction moratorium where people couldn't afford to pay rent. Isusu created a win-win-win construct whereby now landlord that cannot afford to evict their residents, which is the right thing to do, can encourage them to apply for a zero interest loan by us. And when the residents accept, it's paid directly to them. So if you think about what Isusu does, a win to the residents, good credit score, you can keep a roof over your, uh, over your head, a win to the landlord because cash flow is healthy and they are profitable in the event someone can pay rent, and a win to society because we're not solving homelessness backwards. So how do you keep, I, I see the win-win, but I, I'm looking for the third win. How do you keep from losing, right? If someone's already in the position where they're falling behind on a rent payment, and you're giving them an interest-free microloan. It seems like the default rate is not going to be insignificant in, in that situation. I mean, and it doesn't have to be by the resident's, you know, moral fault by any means. It could be a medical bill. It could be anything, but it's a population that's going to have low savings and, and thus is at higher risk for default. How do you avoid um, really losing out in that scenario? John, we live in a society that has treated poor people like they're guilty until proven innocent. If I have a financial issue or you have a financial issue, you have alternative of cheap debt to look onto. That's the fundamental premise of what this country is built on. An opportunity to have a ch fighting chance, an opportunity to have a second chance, an opportunity when you have access to it to get cheap debt. The e big issue here is a large number of people don't have that access. So let's take a step back. For residents that we work with, their landlords already did resident screening on them. Right? They had some sort of income to qualify to live in that home and keep a roof over their head. What we are doing is giving them that fighting chance and making sure we bet on them and there's a probability that they would actually pay that money back. If you juxtapose what we are doing at ASUSU to other models, it, it outperforms because there's an initial vetting that has already happened for people to work with us as compared to other models whereby anyone can walk off the streets and apply. So it's that initial vetting that helps us edge against our credit risk. And we're seeing it outperform compared to other uh, micro loan lending initiatives out there. It makes sense. Uh, tell me how in a, a down economy or even in what we might be heading into, not a traditional down economy, but a, a particularly rough economy for those who don't own capital, uh, how high do the margins on one part of your business have to be to give you the reserves to deal with the you know, unfortunate um, you know, possibility that a significant uh, portion of people who deserve cheap credit, um, but the, they default? It's a thoughtful question, right? So if you, if you think about it this way, the people, the landlords we're working alongside pay us Right? They pay us for our service, not the end um, resident. And if you dissect it closely, right, if we are not in the picture, they suffer more. Right. So where we edge and make a lot of our money is essentially a volume business. Right. You have a lot of you have a lot of rent um, rentals in the United States, 47 million um, sort of multifamily rentals and a whole lot more north of 20 million aggregated right now in the single family space. Um, so we are making money from by working with the landlords, but the residents, what we're doing in turn is giving them a fighting chance to stay in their home. And if we keep the landlord happy, right, we have a low churn as a business, and then the residents can live their financial best by le leveraging our products. There's an exposure. There's no doubt about it. But compared to the markets where you don't have that initial vetting, from a rental screening standpoint, we outperform. And that's the secret sauce to what we are doing. Um, it, it also functions in a way like insurance for the landlord. It seems to like on a, for, for all landlords, right? Like if you can get your residents into this program and why shouldn't 
you be, why shouldn't ASUSU be part of the resident vetting process? If there are enough residents who are in your system who have you know, lived in ASUSU properties, why shouldn't it be easier for them right, to, to get a place somewhere? Because then you're not just checking their credit history or their, you can actually see, do they pay their rent on time, right? Mm-hmm. Is that something that you're doing? Is that something that, that you're planning? John, you know, you have a job at ASUSU anytime um, because um, you, you rightfully predicted some of the exciting things we're, work, we're working on, which, you know, I'm happy to come back on your show and, you know, talk at length about once we're ready to disclose. But ultimately, at the eye level, you're right. What we want to be able to do is understand people's credit risk, be able to price them appropriately, walk them through financial identity, and take them a journey through financial stability and eventually through wealth building. That's the ultimate focus. And that sort of crawl, walk, and run approach is the suite of products we're going to be deploying at ASUSU, ultimately to help people, you know, live their financial best and a better life. You know, I also see an economic development angle here, potentially, right? Like if I'm a locality, if I'm a, a town council or a city council, and somebody wants to put a building in my town. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe we have some policies around wanting some affordable housing component. Why shouldn't we also want an ASUSU component, right? That's going to, along with that affordable housing, uh, guarantee that people have some sort of a safety net, Mm -hmm. right? And the ability to build, there might be, and, and why shouldn't we encourage local businesses to perhaps somehow participate in that uh, as an ESG play. Um, is, is that something that there's conversation about? That's a big conversation around that. Because if you think about the current constructs right now, you know, if someone can afford to pay their rent, they are evicted on the street. And when you think about ESG, right, we know how to me- measure environmental and there's a lot of capital going out there in the marketplace, right? You know, the S play is a huge sort of gap in the marketplace. How do you measure social, right? It's incredibly hard. ASUSU is the first platform out there, especially in residential um, real estate that's helping quantify this factor and other investment um, asset class. Because if you think about it, we can measure how many people establish their credit scores, how many people move from subprime credit to prime credit, and what kind of financial products are they getting access to? And does someone have a card notes before they were on a SUSU's platform? And now do they? And being able to put out a corporate annual report is transformative because now it's not just rhetoric. Hey, I went to the food bank and gave someone food and that's social. That's great. But we need to start thinking about things that are sustainable. How are we moving people from letting them be insane in this American society and then helping them drive towards wealth building in a tangible way? That's the quintessential piece of social mobility we're missing in the marketplace today that ASUSU essentially offers for investors, for asset managers, and then society at large. It's a really interesting space where I feel like we're just beginning to understand the mechanics and the potential to make the system more more fair. Uh, you know, it's interesting. A few weeks ago, um, I had Phaedra Ellis Lampkins, uh, the the CEO of Promise, on, and I, I started thinking about this category that I'm calling just tech, like tech for justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think you you clearly fit in to, to that as well. Well, um, I've learned a bit uh, clearly uh, about Isusu. Now I want to learn some more uh, about you. We'll get back to Isusu and where you go from here, though we've touched on that uh, a bit too. I like to start at the beginning. Uh, so tell me, where were you born? Tell me about household, parents, siblings. So I grew up in the slums of Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, I lost my father at the age of two, and I was raised by my mother and two spirited sisters. One thing my mother fundamentally believed in was the importance of education. She afforded my school fees to one of the finest high schools in the land, and that helped me as expose myself that the destitution of my social position cannot necessarily limit my imagination. Because when all the other kids were applying to go to the United States and Europe, although I got into one of the best schools in the land in Nigeria, 
I took a gap year and studied the SAT on my own. Mm. And that led me to this magical place called America. So to take a step, a step back and, and tell me about kind of the family legacy in Nigeria. Um, what, how had that developed? Uh, you know, how did your parents meet? Um, and, and tell me about the, what led to the circumstances uh, that you were born into. Oh, that's a fascinating question, and no one has really asked me that before. So my parents met um, in Lagos, which is one of the most populous city um, in, in Nigeria um, and one of the most populous in, in, in Af in the, on the African continent also. They met. Um, my dad was a little bit old in, on the older side. He was trying to, you know, sort of have kids. Um, and, you know, they were trying to add two um, sort of girls and they were trying to have a son. Um, so the gap between my, uh, my, the middle sister, I have two sisters, the middle one and myself was essentially 10 years. So I was sort of like the, the miracle child. And when I came around, um, you know, things were really, really rough. Um, you know, we didn't have money. Um, I grew up in some in a situation whereby we didn't have a completed toilet in, in terms of the building my mother and I moved to when we were growing up. We just had to figure things out. You know, it's just like watching my mother walk miracles um, to put a food on, her, on the table. She spent 60 percent of our salary to afford my school fees to one of the finest high schools in the land. And to survive, she, we used to leverage this thing called, you know, a susus. Right. That's where Susu's name actually came from, which is one of the oldest form of banking in the world where a group of people come, pull their money together, um, and then they take turns leveraging that capital. So that's how we survived. But education for me was the pathway um, to where I am today because of the investment of my mother. My father died um, of lung cancer. Um, that's the reason why, um, you, know, um, you know, my mother was sort of left alone to raise all three kids. But I think she did a spectacular job, um, you know, raising us. Yeah. Now, tell me about your, your sisters and um, what their path has been. So my sisters, you know, they're, they're, they're way older than I am. They, you know, they have kids now. Um, I have one sister in, in Lagos still and the other one in Minnesota, uh, which I'm happy to talk about my, my Minnesota journey. Um, and they all have kids. They work in healthcare. Um, you know, the other one sort of does imports and exports in Nigeria. So they're, they're doing very well. I'm an uncle of five. I'm incredibly proud of what my nieces and nephews are doing in the world. Um, you know, they're living a better life than I would ever have imagined at that age. And, you know, it just speaks to their, their character and hard work in terms of how they're raising their kids. What are your earliest memories of Lagos and um, other kids, community there, uh, you know, what you were curious about, interested in? My earliest memories of Lagos, you know, this I have this vivid image in my mind, just playing soccer um, on the street. Uh, we, we call it football um, in Nigeria. Um, and... You know, I used to play barefooted, couldn't afford, you know, a soccer boot um, back then and just play with my friends. You know, we don't play on grass, we play on sand. Um, and despite the fact that we didn't have a lot, the community we had, my neighbors, my friends, my soccer team meant the world to me. But what made me, you know, sort of who I am today, when I think back from an entrepreneur standpoint is, you know, smuggling you know, Game Boy cartridges or PlayStation to, to, to my secondary school and then selling into wealthier kids so I could, you know, have a better life and not put a strain on my mother. I remember that because that entrepreneurial spirit has always been there, although it, it was a necessity at that point. It wasn't a, a nice to have. Those were things I had to do to survive. Um, you know, those memories stick with me because it keeps me grounded and reminds me of where I come from. Um, and never to settle. What was your uh, first experience with kind of understanding that difference and discrepancy in wealth, right? I mean, it sounds like you 
were going to a school eventually that had uh, a range of, you know, kids with a range of experiences and opportunities. Um, but when, when did you realize, oh, there are a lot of differences in the way that people are living? I realized that very earlier on in my life. Um, you know, when I was 11 years old, in America, you probably call it middle school. We call it, um, you know, junior junior school. Yeah, and you know, we 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 essentially didn't have enough money to pay for school fees. Um, and in Nigeria, when you can't pay for school fees in certain schools, you're sent home, and in some cases, you're you're beaten or flogged. Um, and in my case, it was just painful as a kid to experience that whereby all my fellow classmates could be in the classroom and I was being penalized and punished because my mother couldn't afford my school fees. So time and time again, that happened, you know, for multiple years. It wasn't a function because my mother didn't want to do it just because she didn't have the money to do it. Um, so that memory still sticks with me. I still dream about those moments of kids being in school and I'm asked to kneel down and I'm being flogged because my mother couldn't afford the school fees and then I'm sent home. Um, that, that's a memory that I will never forget. And that's when I realized earlier on, especially at that age, um, I had to fend for myself um, and you know, contribute my own humble quota to you know, anything I possibly can to support my mother. Wow. So, I mean, that's literally like an anxiety dream that you have, I, you know, I've got that dream about, you know, showing up to class and realizing it's my first time ever going and the test is that day, which never happened. But this, 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 I mean, it, it's kind of like in a way, kind of almost, but this happened to you. Right. It did. It did happen to me. Um, and it's tough, you know, at that, at that, at that point in your life, you just, you chin up and you're going, but when you reflect, uh, it's incredibly hard, um, you know, at, especially at that young age and you're, you're fending for yourself. Or when kids are going to Europe, because I went to an affluent school to, for summer school, uh, or they're going to the United States and you can do that. Um, it's tough. There are times whereby I couldn't, we couldn't afford textbooks. I used to borrow my friend's textbooks, photocopy it, um, just to be able to, you know, be at par with them. So those things... Um, you know, are hard, but, you know, against all odds, I'm um, here. Yeah. yeah and, and you, you turn to entrepreneurial efforts um, to, to make up the gap. What, what was the first time you remember doing that? I was probably 12 years old. Um, and <laughs> uh, my sister sends me a Game Boy Advance. Um, and I, the, the Game Boy Advance was really, really good. I had Pokemon on, on the, on the game. And I, I, one of my friends that was incredibly way, way wealthy, um, said, wow, you know, this is fascinating. I can't buy this. Um, you know, I, I can't find this in the market. Would you be willing to sell it to me? And I'm like, wow, this person really wants it. So I, you know, I proposed literally 20 half times the price and he bought it. I took the cash, went to the market, bought two um, and a bunch of cartridges, multiple Pokemon games. And then all the kids were buying it for me. I, I became the dealer essentially. Um, and then I graduated to PlayStation games and the CDs. Um, but that was my, that was really my first entrepreneurial journey. And I had this epiphany especially at some point whereby I started making more money than my mother was making in a month at the age of 12, 13. I'm like, there's a lot of value in terms of you doing something and, you know, contributing and creating in the world. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing the nine to five, um, but my path was just a little bit different. And the fun part was I just enjoyed doing it. Um, I enjoyed adding value, being paid for it and continue to expand. And I think, that DNA, um, you know, is still in me, and that's that essentially continued with Asusu. What accounts for the for the knowledge or information gap where you knew where to get this stuff, but your friends didn't? Why didn't Why didn't they just go get it themselves? <laughs> A lot of these kids were sheltered, right? 
they're wealthy, the, the length at which I will go to the markets I will go to, like incredibly dangerous. You can get kidnapped in some of these places in, in, in Nigeria. So I had nothing to lose. I am poor. I grew up in the slums. I grew up in a household sometimes where we didn't have running toilets. What else do I have to lose? Nothing. And was there something about those areas that you knew how to navigate where you had more confidence that you knew how to carry yourself or something? What, was there something there too or no? I think in the United States, we talk about code switch a lot, right? You know, you the way you appear and walk is different from where you engage with your friends at home, especially if you're, you're black or, you know, um, non-white, um, especially in the workplace. And that's the same reality back home in, in Nigeria. You know, when I'm in school, there's a different persona in, in secondary school, engaging with my friends. But when I'm at home, it's a different reality because the different sets of friends, the different things we can navigate. So I knew how to be sophisticated in secondary school. And then I could also navigate my, my way in the toughest and roughest of environments. So that helped me a lot. Um, and that really helped me navigate, you know, where I am today also, because it's a whole bunch of navigation, navigates with investors to speak their language. And then you also navigate with, you know, everyday stakeholders that, you know, their experience, you have a lived experience like them. Um, and that's, that's a lot of value. And you'll be shocked as to how important that is, because you can permeate in different environments and other scans, people panic and freeze and situations they are not comfortable in. Well, many would be shocked. I, I, I would not be shocked, but uh, yes, many, many would be. That's, um, that's really interesting to think about how that concept of, of code switching uh, translates. You know, I, I grew up in the 80s in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and, but went to, you know, on scholarship to a private school in Brooklyn Heights. Right. And yes, very different right? The streets of Brooklyn or the streets of Washington, D.C. and how you behave versus, yes, uh, in, in other settings too. So um, at, at what point does your family, do you get the opportunity to emigrate to another country? We had the opportunity to immigrate to Nigeria, particularly me when I finished, you know, secondary school or what you call high school in, in the United States. Um, I had sort of passed my local exams, the equivalent of the SATs back there, applied for school and got admitted. But I wanted something bigger. It was during this time of President Obama, the hope, I watched the elections, I could tell you all the states in, in America. And I really wanted to come to this magical place where everything was possible, especially a country with such a complex legacy, electing you know, its first African-American um, president was really appealing to me. So I disobeyed my mother, didn't go to the school in Nigeria and decided to study the SATs and um, apply for schools here um, in America. So I immigrated from 80 degree weather. Um, you know, the University of Minnesota gave me an admission to negative 22 degrees in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> now, why didn't your mom want you? Was it that she didn't want you to come to the US or that she just wanted you to stay in Nigeria? But think about it, John. You invested 60% of your salary on your only son. And your only son got into what you call the Harvards of school in Nigeria. And this kid said, mm -mm, I'm not going. I want to go to this magical place called America. My mother is like, a bird in the cage is what's in the bush. Start this school and then you can do your thing. But I am sort of jingoistic. I'm fanatically patriotic about my ideas. And what I wanted to do is have a singular focus and pass the SATs and go to America. Because I know when I start in Nigeria, things would happen and that dream might essentially be taken away from me. So I didn't listen. My mother almost disowned me. Um, but, you know, here I am today. That's the only time my mother ever apologized to me was when I came to America and I was going to college. But now, what did she think was going to happen? And when did she acknowledge did she have to acknowledge that she was wrong about that to the point where she would actually apologize? You know, in African culture, parents don't really care about apologizing and they hate admitting that they are wrong. It's just the nature of the game here. Yeah. Um, I think what my mother was scared of, and it has happened a lot, is a lot of people that have this dream 
of coming to the United States. And it's hard when you're coming from places like Nigeria. A lot of people get, I'll say 80, 90 percent of people get no's when they go to the U.S. embassy. It's not as easy to come to America from a place like Nigeria. So she recognized that reality and the numbers weren't just on my side. Right. I was young, didn't have a lot of, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. It was a high probability the US embassy would say no. There was also a question mark, and what if you don't pass the SATs? You already have this college admission, you can go to school here. And we invested everything we had for me to go to um, this expensive high school. So for my mother, the safest path, and you have to I understand that perspective, was for me to go to this school. But fast forward, it was when I graduated. Um, you know, um, college at the University of Minnesota. And she looked at me and she said, I'm never going to doubt anything you say. You're truly your father's son. And, you know, that's the first time. And she said, I'm sorry. That's the first time my mother has ever said, I'm sorry. And that day was probably the first time she ever said, I love you. Um, and now she says it every time and it's a little bit uncomfortable. But um, yeah, it, it took a long time. But my mother is focused on results. She doesn't care about record, um, rhetoric. She cares about record. Now, you can't hold her to that. She's never going to doubt anything you say because <laughs> she probably went back on that after she did. another week or she two. Did. Yeah. She did. I'll give you a story. Um, I was working in banking and, you know, consulting. I was doing m &A, you know, doing multi-billion dollar deals. She was really excited. And then I came to her and I said, I was going to quit my job and do this thing called Isusu. Oh, my God. It was a deafening silence. And she looked at me, almost teary eyes, and said, I thought we made it. <laughs> but once again, you know, I'm stubborn and, you know, really wanted to fall forward. And that sets off for whatever I had. But she supported me this time. And here we are. So why did you do it? Why um, had you been working this idea on the side for a while, then something happened that made you feel more confident about it? But I mean, the, the idea, the feeling of having made it can be seductive. Why didn't you say, well, you know, there is this established path. Why don't I just do that? It's a good question. And I've reflected on this a lot. And I talked to my co-founder about this. It's really three things, um, John. Yeah. The first thing is I am the kid from the slums of Lagos, Nigeria. No one thought I could do anything. I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to prove to anyone. So my lease is going to expire in this life. I'm going to make the best of it and try as much as possible to make this world a more perfect place. Number two was I really enjoyed corporate America. I did well there. But I really wanted to do something that would have a fundamental impact in the lives of many. I've done it before in my entrepreneur endeavors and see how sort of business can have a profound impact and development. But I really didn't want to settle. And the last thing was, I don't want to be in my deathbed and ask myself, what if? My co-founder and I had this idea and we had the conversation and said, look, are we going to just continue to have it and walk out on this thing post 5 p.m. or post 10 p.m. if you're working in banking and consulting? Um, or are we going to take the plunge? And I'm glad we did. But the biggest lesson learned is just we have nothing to lose. No one thinks anything of us. And we fell forward. Tell me about your co-founder. Where'd, where'd you meet him? And um, how'd you come up with the idea? Um, my co-founder, um, you know, or my work husband, Samir, we met at um, the Clinton Global Initiative Conference. President Clinton hosts this event called the, the Clinton Global Initiative. And there was a sub one for university or graduate school students. I was in graduate school. He was in undergrad at NYU. And we actually didn't meet at NYU. We, we met when President Clinton brought students together. And the idea was, how can you leverage your head for business and your heart for the world to make the world a more better place. So I had an idea. I was running an initial business, building water infrastructure in developing countries. It was essentially building a business then with, you know, transferring food to, you know, soup kitchens and homeless shelters so people can have um, food and the food won't go to waste. 
And we met at that conference. There was an instant bond. The next year, we roomed together at that conference and just started exchanging contacts with ourselves. He went to LinkedIn. I went to Goldman Sachs. And one evening, we met up and said, corporate America is wonderful, but we wanted to do something bigger. We met at Max Brenner's in New York Union Square, um, just sipping on our hot chocolate. And we decided to start working on Isuzu in 2015 on the side. And it took us three years to save up and quit our jobs in 2018 to do what we're doing now. What was the problem that you saw? You, you guys were each already working on um, different types of projects that were benefiting others who were less privileged. Where did housing, right, and, and credit scores come in? Credit and, 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 and sort of housing came into play from our personal experiences. So for me, when my mother and I sort of immigrated from Lagos to, Niger, um, to Minneapolis, we didn't have a credit score. We walked into one of the biggest banks to borrow money and were turned away and had to go borrow money from a payday loan lender at over 400% interest rate. In addition to that, my mother pawned my father's wedding ring and we borrowed from church members. And that's how we got started in America. Really inspired by that experience and my co-founders also, we started Isusu on three core premises. No matter where you come from, the color of your skin and your financial identity shouldn't determine where you end up in the wealthiest nation the world has ever seen. So it's that shared experience that made us create this company. And we've always been of the opinion, and, and that's what our, our vision statement is, is how can we leverage data to bridge the racial wealth gap? And the opportunity we saw was simple. When you pay your mortgage today, it contributes towards your credit score. When you pay your rent, it doesn't contribute towards your credit score. And here's why that's important. On an average, renters, there are 106 to 110 million of them in this country. They send roughly $1,100 to their landlord. John, that's $1.44 trillion every year that's not captured. Less than 10% of that data is captured today. So we decided to create a technology that captures that data, transform it, report it, so our system stops treating people like they are guilty until proven innocent and actually have a financial identity to get quality products. Um, I, I want to get back to um, the, the college portion. We didn't spend a lot of time there. Sure. Um, but specifically, um, what did you learn beyond the classroom experience? Minnesota. Um, <laughs> I, I've never been to Lagos, but I've been to Minnesota. And uh, it doesn't look like the pictures I've seen of Lagos. But you were, but you were also used to navigating right environments with people from different backgrounds. So, so how well did your experience figuring things out and figuring people out translate for you when you came to Minnesota? Mm. It's a very thoughtful question. Coming to Minnesota from Lagos was one of the hardest things uh, because number one, I was dealing with a weather that I never thought humans can operate in. Literally, I came in January, I came in like late December and I was going to college, you know, in January, 2010. And that thing was negative 22 degrees. It's cold that like really affects your bones. And the winter in Minnesota feels like needles you know, going through your face. It's, it's painful. So that in and of itself, that first year was depressing, just trying to figure it all out. But navigating spaces is something that was a necessity and something I had to do to survive, right? Now, code switching between the slums to an affluent school, the same thing had to happen in Minnesota. I came from a place whereby I was majority of what pe like people look like me. So now I'm a minority and I'm noticing, wow, you know, this is a little different. Or when I go to school, right, and I have a tight budget to essentially navigate, I was already used to that life. And thank God for the cafeteria and the mandates for fresh for freshmen to essentially eat there. Um, but it was hard. It was hard navigating those spaces. But I think I excelled better in America because of the opportunities afforded here. And I just stuck to that sort of den rhetoric, which is, you know, you walk hard, you put your head down, things progressively got better. And that was my experience. You know, when I was in college, I was a tutor 
microeconomics, um, macro, personal finance. I was really good at it. And then people pay me just to teach them stuff. That was like genius. I'm like, wow, America is very fascinating. That never happens in Nigeria. <laughs> like you pay me just because I know econ is like the most genius thing I've, I, I thought they ever came up. The AAC, the Academic Assistance Center was my favorite place. I just hang out there and people just come talk to me. I do their homework for them. So that opportunity sort of start, you know, continued. And um, I also founded my first business in America, um, um, in, uh, in Minnesota. I built a company building affordable water infrastructure. Um, and we did that, you know, in over seven countries and provide access to water for over a quarter million people. So, you know, the journey of entrepreneurship evolves in terms of what you learned. But Minnesota made me who I am today. I did things like deer hunting and ice fishing, things I never thought I would ever do. And when I tell people, they're like, wait, what is going on? But I am. Why did you why did you do that? It sounds like I mean, you had the Minnesota experience. It sounds like do you have a Duluth pack, too? (laughs) Duluth is incredibly beautiful, uh, by the way. Wow. I'm sure you know that. Yeah. So the Mississippi actually started on a small creek. Um, in Duluth, right, uh, which is just incredibly beautiful. Um, but I'm always curious, uh, and I'm always looking to learn from people that are fundamentally different than I am. And I'm like that today. You know, they're Republicans, they're Democrats. People have different, varying opinions. But there's always some semblance of truth in between if we truly listen. And that's something we don't do a lot of. So I've always been curious to get both sides. Because that's, those are the kind of spaces I had to navigate. I had to go to school with the wealthiest of kids when I didn't have anything. And I understood the struggles they were going through, even if it was not peculiar to what I was going through. You know, it was this concept that, you know, we are all the same. What binds us together is greater than the things that separate us. The place I was going to school in Minnesota, which was Crookston, the northwestern corner, one of the sister schools of the ones in the Twin Cities, was incredibly conservative. And I came from a city of north of 20 million people. I learned a lot from those people. Those people kept me grounded. They taught me a lot about myself. And we had the most fierce debates when I was campaigning for President Obama. And some of them, I changed their minds. Um, For the first time, they ever voted for a Democrat. And that's something I hope we continue to do in this society today is talk to each other because what binds us together is greater than the things that separate us. Okay, so um, tell me about uh, what I call Death Valley, mm-hmm. lowest point. Hmm. Um, so we, we've covered a little bit the uh, founding of Isuzu, um, and you know you, you've got momentum now; it's it, it's up and running. But whether it has to do with the company itself or even your journey before the company, was there a point? where you kind of hit a wall or thought, whatever my plans were, um, it, it's not going to work out. I've, I've got to change course. There was a big debt valley building Isuzu, my co-founder, and it's, there are multiple, you know, and we can go in stages that sort of, they rhyme. And it's, it's a build up to something really, really painful. And then there's a breakthrough. I think the most glaring one throughout that journey was talking to 329 investors, VCs, and saying no. No, no, no. And you just get immune. I, I don't know. I don't even call it immune. It's like thorns eating your skin and rejection. It's utterly painful. And we got to a point whereby in this journey, where we had a lead investor invest in the company and then they had to pull out. Um, that was January of 2019. That was one of the lowest lows of our lives. And we had actually just closed the deal with my alma mater, University of Minnesota, to sell a Susu's product to help everyday res- um, students, to help them get a degree in one hand and a credit score on, on our hand because these college students don't have um, good, they don't have any credit score in the first place, so we're hoping to establish it. It was a $20,000 contract, John. But what was interesting is my co-founder and I had quit our jobs, 
We didn't have a credit score. A good credit score, everything was damaged. And our credit cards were like at $80,000 each. It was maxed out. So we closed a $20,000 deal. We couldn't afford an hotel room. We went to a Denny's in Fargo, North Dakota. And it was sub-freezing weather. Our strategy was simple. You go there, you open up your computer, you order a Grand Slam, the cheapest things on the menu, right? You're chipping away, you're eating. The idea was just to walk all night because the diner opens all through and we're going to catch our flight, you know, from Fargo to San Francisco to go raise more money. Unfortunately for us, around 2.10 or so, we started dozing off. So the restaurant manager of the Dennis came through and said, gentlemen, you have to leave. So we got kicked out of a Dennis around 2 a.m. in the morning. I was very humble. I looked at him dead eye. I said, please don't kick us out now. Let's just call a Uber that will take us to the airport. And he gracefully did. And we took that Uber to the airport. We got there. You remember those massage chairs at the airport? We just slouched and just passed out there. What's ironic, John, is the next day, we took a flight and we slept in a probably a $20 million mansion. One of our prospective investors, now current investor. And we were two blocks from Mark Zuckerberg's house. Look at that juxtaposition. Got kicked out of a dentist the night before. Slept on a massage chair at the airport. And the next day, we went to our investor's house to raise money next to one of the wealthiest person um, on the earth. That point was incredibly hard. And we thought we were just going to abandon this dream and go do something else. But we just kept on trying. You know, one thing we've always been taught is just, regardless of what life throws at you, be caught trying. And for us, that we didn't have anything to lose. We didn't have wealthy parents that expected anything from us. It was really our only option. Um, except it wasn't your only option, right? Because you had left jobs to do this. And if you had stayed with those jobs, you wouldn't have been getting kicked out of a Denny's in sub-freezing weather. Right. So what was it? I mean, w- was this kind of the the last push, this flight? Um What would you have done if that investor hadn't come through? Uh, Where was your head? Well, the worst part is that investor came through, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't what we were trying to raise, right? So there's a twist. Raising that capital, a a seed round of finance, which was $1.6 million, you know, two costs. And after that lowest point, an additional four months to essentially raise. So we kept, we just kept on going. To your point, though, John, look, we left corporate America. Some of the partners invested in us, gave us their 5K. Some of our friends put out sort of buying a home to invest in us earlier on, right? When we did our pre seed sort of family and friends around. We're not going to disappoint those people. We're not going to give up, right? We are, and even if we give up, we're going to go back to corporate America. We can always go back there. But we're not going to just do that without trying and trying. And that's all we knew how to do. The way we thought about it was an analogy that kept us sane was, look, we brought a wooden ship to this island, which is a susu. We burnt it and we're going to build a nice steel ship and sail around the world. And if we decide to go to the ocean without that steel ship, we're going to sink and drown. We're willing to die and be caught trying. And that's what we did with the company. We're not going anywhere. We don't give up. Okay. So is there a core belief that came from that experience, right? Um, when when you thought you would perhaps hit bottom um, and, and you managed to claw back from there that you continue to use uh, on this journey? If so, what is it? The biggest lessons learned for us is one thing we always say when we are now, when we have big announcements and we use it when we raise the 130 million and the company's valued at a billion now is against our odds. When you look at stats and you want to model our lives on statistics, we are outliers, point blank period, right? 
the odds are not on our side. When you look at the number, you look at the color of our skin, look at the people raising the kind of capital we've raised, look at people sort of building the businesses we've built, we're fundamentally different. So for us, we don't care about the odds because we have this mindset of regardless of what life throws at us, we're going to be caught trying, right? And that is the spirit and the word we always use. Any big monumental announcement, the first line in all caps is against all odds. And it's to inspire other people that look like us that although you might not see an opportunity, you might look at the picture and the opportunities don't necessarily represent what you look like. There's still a lot of opportunities for you to chase after. Um, after. It's just, you just have to think about it and be caught trying. Yeah, I guess uh, once you beat the odds the first time and you end up in the high stakes game, why, why bow out early, right? Um, exactly. Why? <laughs> Be caught trying. Continue. Just continue to go and explore the road less traveled. That's the mindset. So um, talk to me ab about where you go from here. We, we talked a little bit about this in the beginning and the possibilities of how the business can expand. Um, it, it looks like to me, um, from, a, from a business news and economic perspective, like we're heading into a pretty rough period with inflation, with uh, the breakdown of globalization at the same time causing companies, I mean, you would think that would be good, but companies are going to have to cut back on expenses and they're going to think about labor differently, particularly in certain segments of the market. What does that mean that, you, uh, that you're going to be focused on as Isuzu in, in this, over this next year or two? So let, let, let me put on my investment banking or consulting ads and let's look at the current state of the market, right? We are seeing record rates inflation shooting up to 9%. We've seen the highest deployment of money supply in the history of this country ever recorded, especially during COVID. So we have an oversupply of cash and then prices are going up. And then we've seen also stock, like growth stock particularly outperform at length and price to earning ratio is not what it is anymore. And there's a lot of sort of bloated um, investments out there, which means, which begs, which begs us to think about what happens to people's sort of retirement plans when we have a big recession. The last thing is we've not had a major downturn since the 2008 financial crisis. And we know markets are, have their ebbs and, you know, their ups and their downs. I think we've just had a bull market all through. And now we're having a beer market and we need to navigate it. The biggest thing, John, is a lot of people, everyday people, poor people, are the ones that are going to suffer the most, right? And for us, it's incumbent for us to think about how do we create opportunities and businesses that makes the world a more perfect place, but at the same time outperform. We call ourselves justice capitalists at Isusu because we believe we can build businesses like that. Our business is positioned to outperform in a down market because we're focused on the people that are going to be disproportionately impacted. Point blank simple. All right. And uh, be caught trying. I like that. That's the um, key word. That's the key word. Be caught trying, explore the road less traveled, and the best is yet to come. Abe, uh, thanks for sharing with me about Isusu and about your own personal journey on Fort Knox. It's been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me.